Hello, my name is Taya Graham and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As I always make clear, this show has a single purpose, holding the politically powerful institution of policing accountable. And to do so, we don't just focus on the bad behavior of individual cops. Instead, we examine the system that makes bad policing possible. And today, we will achieve that goal by showing you this video of police brutality so shocking that some of it we simply have to censor. It's a use of force that severely injured a man who had been cooperating with police. But it's also a developing story because how the department who employed these officers have handled the case shows that when cops cause harm, holding them accountable is a never ending task. But before we get started, I want you watching to know that if you have video evidence of police misconduct, please email it to us privately at par at therealnews.com or reach out to me on Facebook or Twitter at Taya's Baltimore and we might be able to investigate for you. And please like, share and comment on our videos. It helps us get the word out and can even help our guests. And you know I read your comments and appreciate them. You see those little hearts and likes I give out down there. And we do have a Patreon called Accountability Report. So if you feel inspired to donate, please do. We don't run ads or take corporate dollars. So anything you can spare is truly appreciated. All right. We've gotten that out of the way. Now, one of the most pervasive problems with American policing is not just brutality, corruption, or overly aggressive enforcement. It's not just over policing or speed traps or the misuse of the law to trump up charges on innocent civilians. No, the most prevalent and stubborn issue we see in our coverage of police is how hard it is to hold them accountable for it. Time after time, in story after story, it seems that when police screw up, the mechanisms of governance become immobilized, unable to discipline the police officers for transgressions that would put you or me in jail. That's why today we are reporting on a case of brutality so disturbing, we can't even show you everything that happened on this show. An act of violence that resulted in a life altering injury for the victim, but so far little or no repercussions for the cops. The story starts in Zapata County, Texas, where Laredo County police were called to a domestic dispute that up to the point where police had arrived had not been violent. Take a look. <laughs> However, soon, for reasons that have yet to be explained, police escalated the encounter. Just watch. <laughs> Now, a note before I show the rest of this video, I understand how domestic calls are not only the most volatile, but also the most consequentially dangerous for both police and the people involved. I get that walking into the middle of a conflict between family members can be fraught with both underlying tensions and even sudden violence. However, no situation, or at least none that I can imagine, can justify the consequences of the use of force by these officers during this arrest. Nothing can explain what you are about to see. Now we have covered the video in part so you could see most of it. Otherwise YouTube probably wouldn't let us show any of it, but still please be advised what we're about to show may be upsetting and disturbing. Oh, you were getting my face. I was trying to help you out. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, what happened in the part of the video we had to censor 
is simply put, horrific. The officers, while attempting to take Mr. Rigoberto Parrientos to the ground, broke. And I mean compound fractured his leg. They literally turned his leg backwards. They essentially severed his leg from his body. The injury was so severe the doctors could not reattach it. Instead, they had to amputate it below his knee. It is a horrifying injury that has literally changed his life. No, no, no. no. That's a lot of blood. Yeah, he's under the influence. Yeah, what she told me, I was going to start detaining me. I was going to detain. I was going to put you under your back. He starts to yeah, clean Yeah, and then up. we go down, and that's it. And then he goes down, and all of a sudden, I see Tato. Like, whenever we get to the handcuffs. Dude, I it's because I saw he was missing a leg. I was like, where is his leg? Yeah. It was oh, like, I, and literally, I, like, I, 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 wait. I'm, I'm it was literally, like, I'm smiling because, out. dude, it, it threw us everybody out. It was like, literally, like, where is his leg? And then I saw, and I like, pulled it out, thinking it was, like, going to be dislocated or something and bro and i knew i should have came as soon as i heard the call but i didn't think much of it i thought it was gonna be like but here's the surprising twist so far the police department and the local prosecutor's office have said nothing about the two officers involved they haven't even confirmed that there's any investigation into the traumatic use of excessive force at all nor have they even promised to consider criminal charges for the brutality although mr barrientos had been charged with resisting arrest despite the fact he was not charged with domestic violence here's a clip from the press conference held by the victim's lawyer kevin green where you can see the devastating impact of the injury inflicted by the police. Just look. I'm an attorney out of Austin, Texas. My name is Kevin Green. I also have the honor and privilege of representing Mr. Uh, Rigoberto Berrientos, who uh, lost his leg. He was a victim of uh, four sheriff's deputies that assaulted him um, last year. And then his case lay buried beneath a false police report where the uh, deputy who filled out that report lied and said that uh, Mr. Barriento started a fight with that deputy. We know because I fought along with my partner, Thomas uh, Lyons Jr., uh, very hard to finally get the Zapata uh, County officials to give us uh, a copy of all of the police body cam footage. Uh, the footage is absolutely horrific. It shows an unprovoked arrest that with no probable cause. And then much, much worse, it shows that the four deputies decided to body slam uh, Mr. Barrientos face first towards con a concrete uh, floor and what braced his fall and probably kept him from uh, severe facial and spine injuries was his knee. So I am today uh, pleading with the uh, county officials, the county commissioners, the sheriff himself, anyone that will listen in Zapata County to release that video and to make some statements, tell people what they intend to do to fix this, to make sure that no one else gets hurt like Mr. Barrientos and to make sure that the public knows that no one's gonna tolerate uh, a hyper-violent police force that's just taking it out on, on people because they can. But still, police have stayed silent and refused to comment publicly about how they are handling this case. Even the mainstream media in Texas has been reluctant to call out law enforcement, despite the severity of the use of force we just revealed to you on your screen. So the process of keeping this story alive has been taken up by none other than a group of Texas cop watchers, First Amendment watchdogs who, despite being under pressure from law enforcement themselves, have continued to report on the story to keep us informed. And soon we will be joined by Corners News to talk about how he and other cop watchers have continued to put pressure on local law enforcement. But first, I'm going to check in with my reporting partner, Stephen Janice, who's been looking into the case and reaching out for comment. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So, Stephen, what is your take on how police are handling this investigation? What stands out to you? Really, Tay, what stands out to me is that they're not handling it. I mean, we pulled a federal lawsuit 
that Mr. Badientos filed. And it says basically that the officers lied in the statement of probable cause, that the officers had said that he was in a fighting stance and that he had threatened them. Now, I want you to watch that video and tell me if you see the officers, if you see Mr. Badientos threatening anybody, because I certainly don't. But what's really interesting is there's a footnote that says that the case was referred to the Texas Rangers, who then referred it to the Department of Justice, but only about the lying on the statement of probable cause, which is bad in of itself, but nothing about the use of force being in any way um, reviewed by prosecutors or reviewed viewed by the Texas Rangers, so really handling it poorly. Now, you've been reaching out to the police for comment. What are they saying? Well, it's really interesting. I called them and I said, can you respond to what happened? Can you respond to the lawsuit? Uh, they have said nothing. But let's remember, they stonewalled on releasing this body camera footage for almost a year. Um, I'm not surprised they don't have any comment, but the lawsuit speaks for itself. They have yet to answer this in federal court. So right now, these allegations, which are numerous against this department, including the fact that they basically detached his leg from his body and then stood around and chuckled about it, um, you know, have not yet had a court response. So the, right now, the agency is just stonewalling. How does this stonewalling compare to other cases of police brutality that you've reported on that police have tried to cover up? I feel like this is a classic case of wait and hope people forget, which is something that we saw in our hometown of Baltimore for years until the death of Freddie Gray in police custody. And the outrage was so, you know, intense that they had to answer. But this is a classic case of wait, delay, you know, obfuscate, do whatever you can to make sure the people are no longer paying attention. Thank God the cop watchers are, and some people are refusing to let go of this story. But for now, I think the police are hoping that everyone will, and they certainly should. And now we're joined by cop watcher and auditor Corners News, otherwise known as Ismael Rincon. Corners News, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me again. Ismael, you have been instrumental in releasing information about an incredibly disturbing incident with the Zapata County Sheriff's Department. Can you tell me a little bit about the incident? Why were the sheriffs at Mr. Barrientos' home? So this happened in, in Zapata, uh, Zapata County. Uh, it happened on April the 26th, I believe, 2022. And they were they were uh, called for a domestic disturbance, according to the their uh, their affidavit to a domestic disturbance, and uh, everything was calm and no violence, according to any of the parties. No, there was no violence at at any time. So that's that's why they were called to that specific address. So this seems to be a very calm encounter that we see on the body camera footage. What suddenly changed that he ended up suffering these horrific injuries? Well, basically, he was. He was talking and the one of the officers didn't like what, what he was saying or the way he was uh, talking to him. Uh, he wasn't being disrespectful or anything. He was just being uh, firm with what he was saying. And they were, they claimed on video, they were drinking, both, both of them. So I think that played uh, some sort of a role and uh, them treating him the way they, they did. But as far as violence, he never he never did anything violent or, or threatening or uh, anything. In, the, in their report, he said that Mr. Barrientos squared up to the officer and we don't see that ever on the, on the body cam. Uh, also, they, uh, the, the injuries he suffered were, uh, were severe. His, his knee bent, the way the knee the knee is not supposed to bend, and it tore his, his skin and ligaments and everything completely completely out. It was was bleeding out in, in front of his his own house. What were the exact injuries that Mr. Barriento suffered? What was the medical treatment rendered at the scene, and what surgery did he receive at the hospital? So uh, his bone uh, ripped his his, uh, his skin, ligaments, uh, muscle, everything. And Mr. Barrientos was was bleeding out. They had to use two tourniquets to stop the bleeding. Uh, I, I would I would say if they wouldn't uh, apply those tourniquets, it it would have bled out in front of his house. So uh, uh, EMS responded. They uh, took him to a Laredo Medical Center because Zapata County doesn't have a hospital. So they they took him to Laredo Medical Center in, in Laredo, Texas. They couldn't or uh, they, he needed more specialized uh, care. So they transported him to Zapata, to a hospital in Zapata, and they couldn't save his leg. So they had to amputate his leg. Those, those are severe 
injury for for not even being arrested because he wasn't arrested. They claim on video he he was not under arrest. They because uh, EMS asked the the Zapata County uh, deputies, "Is he under arrest?" or because because they need to know that uh, because if he's under arrest, they need to cuff him to the to the bed to the uh, uh, they need to, they need to restrain him when when somebody's under arrest or they need some officer inside the ambulance. So they asked that question and everybody said, no, he's not under arrest, he's not a threat. And after that fact, they decided to add the, the charges of resisting arrest, which we all know that secondary, that's a secondary charge. What did you see of the officer's response on the scene on the body-worn camera? How would you describe how they handled the injuries and the damage they caused him? What was the demeanor of the officers during the medical crisis? I would say they were in shock. Uh, most of them didn't didn't even respond. They didn't know how to respond. <clears throat> uh, one of them, uh, the one that applied the tourniquet, he uh, he appeared to be the most uh, uh, senior officer there. In my opinion, I, I really don't I, I don't have their personal files or anything. But uh, he took action right away. He applied the tourniquet and and he uh, asked for a second tourniquet and he applied the second one. And and uh, as far as the other deputies, they were just uh, in shock. They oh, one of them even said, I've, "I've been, I think he said 18 years, and this is the first time this ever uh, happens or something similar to this happened." Do you know what Mr. Barrientos was charged with and how those charges are being adjudicated? Mr. Barrientos was charged after the fact. Uh, at that point, they, they told him, you're not under arrest. Uh, we can give you a ride uh, wherever you want. So so he was he was never under arrest. Uh, I, I don't, I really, I'm not sure at what point they decided to add the charge uh, or the charges to him. Uh, but eventually they uh, they dropped him because he, the, to start off with, uh, resistant arrest is a secondary charge. And they had that. There's no elements to meet that that crime. What does civil rights attorney Kevin Green have to say about the process of getting and even releasing the body camera footage? Uh, Mr. Green, uh, Kevin Green is a his civil rights attorney. He's from uh, based in Austin, Texas. Uh, he was saying that they have to file a suit in in Zapata County for them to release it. Uh, they were trying to hold this for it was for more than a year. This happened in April 2022, and they just released the body camera last week. So that that says a lot from a department. They uh, instead of them trying to uh, uh, show the public what happened uh, and 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 get some accountability or or some responsibility for for what happened. Uh, they were trying to hide it. Have sheriffs involved in this case been charged or placed on leave? Has there been any disciplinary action taken? No, I I asked the attorney uh, if there was any sort of criminal investigation going on uh, against the the deputies that participated in in this uh, detainment slash uh, arrest. Uh, To his knowledge, no, there isn't any criminal investigation going on. The, uh, The sheriff uh, I've been getting word from uh, people living in Zapata County that when we posted the video, the sheriff didn't even show up to work for for a couple of days. So there, and he's up to re uh, for re-election of, uh, in 2024 again, and he's not giving interviews. He's not giving uh, any statements. Uh, he's not showing up to work. So I mean, that that that's. that's speaks volumes. So one question I have is because the body worn camera footage is so graphic and so brutal, has it been difficult to get this information out to the community? The platforms we use or, or the platforms I use uh, is the, the most common platforms, uh, YouTube and, and Facebook. And whenever there's something that graphic, it, it doesn't recommend it like other videos. So uh, first of all, it's not monetized. YouTube doesn't really recommend videos that are not monetized because they want to get their their cut as far as reaching out to to people it is it is getting attention but just 
or by the word of mouth uh, or their sharing link. But as far as YouTube and Facebook recommending it, uh, no, it, it's not because it's, it's, it's first it's not monetized. They don't they don't recommend graphic uh, videos, which in this case is, is I think is the most graphic I've, I've seen. How is the community responding to the information you have released to the public about this case? Well, a lot of them didn't didn't know about the incident. They found out when we released the, the video and the uh, press conference. So a lot of them weren't even aware about what was happening. And there's this one lieutenant that used to work in, in that county that complained about Martinez's uh, actions. Martinez is the one that took down Mr. Barrientos. And before that incident, uh, this lieutenant had complained to the sheriff, and the sheriff told him that... Uh, there was nothing wrong that he was, he just had something against him. And after that, they fired the lieutenant because the lieutenant was complaining about the bad officers and he got fired for that. How important is it for citizens who are First Amendment auditors or citizen journalists with YouTube channels? How important is your role in getting information like this out to the public? I mean, what do you think you offer that your local mainstream media doesn't? I'm very happy you asked this question. Uh, and at the press conference, it was me, another uh, citizen journalist from uh, another county, from Star County, which is next to Zapata uh, on the south end. And the other media that was there was the uh, mainstream media uh, from from Laredo, local, local news. They were there with their big cameras and everything. They didn't. They haven't posted anything yet. As, as far as I know, they haven't posted anything regarding this case. Um, I really think we do play a, a pretty important part in getting this sort of news out to, to the public because if it wasn't for us, they, they still wouldn't know what was happening. Uh, usually, local media doesn't, doesn't cover this type of incidents, uh, brutalities or civil rights cases. They, they don't because they, they're friends with the chief or their friends with city council members or, or whatever the case may be. But uh, mainstream media doesn't cover this, this sort of incident uh, of police misconduct. They don't, they don't like dealing with this sort of stuff. Can you give me an update on your fight against being charged with RICO conspiracy for cop watching with other people that have monetized YouTube channels? So as, as far as the charges I, I currently have, at the, uh, the active ones is, is the Livingston case, uh, which uh, you were mentioning, the RICO charge, uh, it's, it's four of us. Brandon just got reindicted last week, I, I, I believe, for the same charge. Melanie's charge got dismissed, but according to uh, what they're, uh, they're, they're saying out there is that the reason it got dismissed is because they want to reindict her. Matthew and myself need to go to court on August the 1st. So we have we have a arraignment on August the 1st. So we still we're, we're still fighting uh that that case. Currently I am still facing two misdemeanor charges for interference with public duty. One from uh Department of Public, Texas Department of Public Safety and the other one from uh Laredo Police Department which are are still active. I'm, I'm still I still have those those three cases pending, two misdemeanors and one one felony. How are you continuing your legal fight for First Amendment activities for the cop watchers in your community? So the reason I, I stood in that incident is because uh, an officer entered my property, my personal property, uh, when I, I was legally carrying my uh, my firearm, and he seized it. He uh, they cuffed me. They searched my pocket for my wallet and. And they went all the way. They even injured uh, my rotator cuff. So I, I sued for that. And that's what it, I believe that that's what started everything. And and even after that case, I, I didn't get arrested. But after that, the incident where I got arrested for allegedly violating city ordinance when uh, they had a, a COVID curfew, they arrested me for golf charges as well for gathering when I was by myself and, and you know that gathering got to be with two or more of uh, uh, people in order to be considered gathered that's when I went uh, full time now, I won't say full time but full force like trying to 
record all the interactions uh, I had and interactions I, I saw in public. I started recording and after that, kept getting arrested and arrested. So to this day, I have seven arrests. Uh, before that, I had a clean record. As far as money, it, it is expensive. It is very, very expensive. They, they uh, People comment on my social media that I'm just here for a quick buck or a quick lawsuit and and that never happens. There's never a quick bug. There's never a, a quick lawsuit. Th that never happens. You have to be in for a couple thousand dollars, couple a uh, couple thousand dollars before you get a criminal charge dismissed, or before before you file a, a lawsuit, or before you win a, a lawsuit. As far as m monetary, it, it is expensive, and you also lose a lot of friends. You lose uh, family members uh, stop talking to you, and uh, I mean that's. That's a the personal cause uh, one one has for for doing what I do. I know I'm doing the right thing because I'm not violating the law. I don't. I'm not breaking the law. I'm not hurting anyone. I'm trying to expose the the evil side of the government. Now, if there is one lesson of the horrific example of police brutality we just witnessed can teach us, it is this. Holding police accountable is a process that requires us, the people, not the establishment, to work. Meaning we can't just sit back and wait for elected officials or a local prosecutor, or as I said before, the mainstream media, to do anything unless we, meaning you and I, are willing to act. I mean, the fact that this case is simply stalled is a remarkable example of how police can protect themselves as long as we are willing to sit on our hands. It is exactly the type of case that proves the age old adage, if you want something done right, do it yourself. I mean, how often have police only been held accountable because a cop watcher or citizen journalist decided to pick up their cell phone and record? How many times was it a citizen exercising their first amendment rights, not the police who've exposed wrongdoing and broke through the thick blue line. Just remember, in our last live stream, we discussed how cop watchers James Freeman and James Madison were both breaking stories about police corruption on their YouTube channels that the mainstream media had overlooked. Both had covered malfeasance and challenged the status quo, and both were filling gaps in the coverage of our criminal justice system that had been ignored and needed more attention, not less. Case in point, though, on how the people are the best check on law enforcement is exemplified by a recent lawsuit settlement with the Kansas State Police over what was called, and I'm not kidding, the Kansas Two-Step. Now, before I, I explain that, let me set the scene a little bit. According to the lawsuit filed on behalf of an out-of-state motorist, Kansas State Police had a little racket going on the I-70 corridor that ran from Colorado across the state. Because Colorado has legalized marijuana, the state troopers had conjured a way to make a pretextual stop to eventually ensnare drivers into a search. The lawsuit alleges the motive was simple. Since Colorado has legalized marijuana, the troopers would purposefully pull over cars with Colorado plates, hoping to catch them with marijuana. To make this happen, the troopers would pull over drivers, write them a citation, and then engage in the so-called Kansas two-step. Because as the lawsuit recounts, the trooper would begin to walk to his or her car, stop, turn around and then try to engage the motorist in a conversation again. The idea was by extending the stop, the officer could convince the out-of-state motorist to consent to a search. The hope being that because the motorist was from Colorado, the tactic would net an arrest. Now, fortunately, several of the motorists who police attempted to ensnare sued the state of Kansas. The plaintiffs were joined by the ACLU, which helped file suit on their behalf. And interestingly, a federal district court judge in Kansas was more than sympathetic to their case. We know this because she issued a scathing opinion that basically called the police profiteers looking for bounty on the highway, so to speak, while trampling the rights of the motorists involved. In fact, let me just quote a few excerpts from the ruling. She characterized this policy as a war on our rights, writing, the war is basically a question of numbers. Stop enough cars and you're bound to discover drugs. And what's the harm if a few constitutional rights are trampled along the way? As a result, all drivers on I-70 have moving targets on their back, she wrote in the opinion, which included an injunction ordering troopers to stop 
two-stepping. Now, thinking about both the judge's words and the way the Texas police have handled the story of Rigoberto Parientos, I think we can see a predominant theme emerge, a through line that we need to keep in mind when we debate how to hold law enforcement accountable and how to ensure police are doing what we pay them for, namely focusing on public safety. If there is one theme and one word I could use to describe both of these cases of police abuse, I think it would be this, insular. Police literally have the power to insulate themselves from scrutiny. And when they do, it's easy to see the adage that absolute power corrupts applies to a gun and a badge. I mean, one of the most common refrains I hear from people who we try to help on this show exemplifies this problem. I never thought the police had problems, they say, until it happened to me, which is why it's so important to keep an eye on police and push back hard when they abuse their power even if it doesn't involve us directly. I mean, just think about it. The excessive use of force that led to an amputation has pretty much gone nowhere. Literally no word of an investigation or even an examination of the series of events that led to it. Not a single official statement or pronouncement has promised to at the very least account for why the officers felt justified in using such extreme force. Meanwhile, a bunch of Kansas state troopers decided it would be fair and constitutional to simply terrorize innocent motorists to nab them for a crime that was literally legal across state lines, a scheme to take advantage of the disparity of laws to try to entrap and entangle innocent people in the expansive and precarious law enforcement net. These same troopers were totally disengaged from keeping highways safe or protecting the citizenry from reckless driving, instead deciding to notch bogus arrests and maybe obtain some free weed in the process. My, my point is that both these cases prove undoubtedly that so as long as police feel they are immune to the law, it is up to us, again, the people, to disabuse them of this notion. When police start to think they can rack up bogus tickets, make unnecessary arrests, and literally snap a man's leg off during a routine encounter, the task is left to cell phone cameras, indie journalists, and YouTube channels to make sure that none of this ever happens again. That's why independent journalists like myself and Steven are so grateful for the cop watchers and citizen journalists we cover and speak to regularly. That's why we are both thankful and hopeful that a movement has sprung up in which the people, not the elites, hold cops and the powers that enable them accountable. I think it's a reminder of what we've both lost and gained in the evolution of social media platforms like YouTube, which give everyday citizens the ability to report the news. I liken it to the emergence of punk music in the 1970s and into the 80s, the counterculture movement that embraced a DIY do-it-yourself ethos. In both style and engagement, punk was stripped down, authentic, and people-powered music intended to pillory and usurp the gaudy and pretentious synthetic rockers who ruled the airwaves at the time. Punk simply stole the show by building a community of rebels and upending the world with music that was as revolutionary as it was aesthetically offensive. And when I say that, I do say it with love because I do indeed love punk music. But let's remember it was the message, so to speak, to the powers that be that our voices would be heard and that our right to speak out against corporate greed, unjust rest, and over-policing belonged to the people who suffered the consequences of these policies, not just the elites who implemented them. It was like cop watching, a wholly organic uprising, not just a political revolution, but a transformation of us, of our community, the people we've met and interviewed and spoken to, and the truths it has revealed. It was a profound and universal statement of the entire idea of equitable and just community that every voice should be heard. That's why we produce the show. That's why we listen to those who are ignored. And that's why we lift up the voices that will not remain silent, the voices of a movement that will not be ignored. I wanna thank my guest Corners News for joining us and for his important work in getting the truth out. Thank you, Ismail. And of course, I have to thank intrepid reporter Stephen Janis for his writing, research, and editing for the piece. Thank you, Stephen. Taya, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank friends and mods of the show, Noli D and Lacey R for their support. Thank you. And a very special thanks to our Accountability Report Patreons. We appreciate you. And I look forward to thanking each and every single one of you personally in our next live stream. And I want you watching to know that if you have video evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate for you.
please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can always message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter and Facebook. And please like and comment. I really do read your comments and appreciate them. And we've got our Patreon link pinned in the comments below for accountability reports. So if you feel inspired, please do. Anything you can spare is greatly appreciated. My name is Taya Graham, and I am your host of the Police Accountability Report. Please be safe out there. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.